Good afternoon. Welcome. And thank you for attending today's presentation ceremony of the Chancellor's Award for GLBT Leadership. My name is Rob Deroff. I'm a professor of uh, clinical psychiatry, associate chief for education uh, in the VA's mental health service. And I had the honor to chair the 2011 sele selection committee for today's awards. In a few minutes, you're going to hear a word of introduction from the Office of Diversity and Outreach and then our chancellor will introduce outstanding members of the UCSF community and present each with their award. As you're probably aware, diversity is one of the chancellor's priorities on campus, and we're especially pleased that she joins us today at this, her second GLBT Leadership Award ceremony. This is now the 11th year for this important award, and I want to personally really congratulate uh, today's winners. I also want to thank those who submitted nominations this year because without you this award would not exist. If your nominee was not selected this year, I'd also encourage you to resubmit uh, your nomination next year. So each year the awards committee reviews the nominations of truly exceptional members of UCSF's faculty, staff, uh, and then student, resident, postdoctoral scholar population, so three separate groups. The selection committee assesses nominees among the following potential criteria. The individuals excel in elevating the status and visibility of GLBT people on campus. They advance an environment of respect and understanding. They may be mentors to GLBT trainees, they generate and disseminate knowledge of GLBT health issues, and they advance the admission and upward mobility of GLBT people on campus. In short, these are our model citizens, the stars among the stars at UCSF. At this point, I would like to ask recipients of the Leadership Award from prior years, not this year, to stand. Your presence really enriches today's ceremony, and I want to encourage you all to check out the names of all of the prior awardees displayed in the lobby of the Medical Sciences Building. I also want to thank members of the Chancellor's Award for GLBT Leadership Selection Committee for your hard work on this important committee. Would you all please stand, those of you who are here. Thank you for your work. This really is a difficult challenge, a very difficult challenge to identify just three out of the many inspiring nominees that we had for this award. Again, thank you in advance for coming. I hope that you'll uh, have a few minutes to congratulate all of the award recipients at the reception immediately following the ceremony with some very special cupcakes marking, <laughs> marking the occasion. It is now my pleasure uh, to introduce Misty Lotterly from the Office of Diversity and Outreach who will speak on behalf of Vice Chancellor Renee Navarro. Thank you, Dr. Dara, and thank you all for attending this very important event. I'm honored to stand before you and speak on behalf of Vice Chancellor Dr. Renee Navarro. She regrets that she couldn't be with, here, with you here today, but she sends her warm congratulations to the award recipients, Dr. Michael Reyes, Dr. Chris Waddling, and Dr. Ilana Scherer. She thanks you each for being, um, she thanks each of you for being champions of GLBT causes at UCSF and beyond and for making this institution a better place. Vice Chancellor Navarro is charged with developing and carrying out a strategic plan for diversity and outreach at UCSF. The mission of the Office of Diversity and Outreach is to build a diverse faculty, student, and staff community, to nurture a climate that is welcoming and supportive, and to engage diverse ideas for the provision of culturally competent, 
education discovery and patient care a special assistant to the vice chancellor i am committed to the successful implementation of diversity and outreach initiatives at u c s f and to the continued success of programs in this first year i look forward to the office establishing itself as a central entity on campus as a hub for resources a gateway to u c s f programs and opportunities and really a place where all groups at UCSF feel safe to voice their concerns, to collaborate, and to celebrate differences. I'm thrilled that the Center for LGBT Health and uh, LGBT, LGBT Center for Health and Equity is now a component of the Diversity and Outreach Office. I believe this new structure will allow for the continued success of the center so that UCSF may continue to be a leader in LGBT health and equity. There have been many advances on the GLBT front this year, and I'd like to take a moment to highlight our recent accomplishments. The Medical Center received the fourth consecutive perfect score on the Healthcare Equality Index. We hosted the nation's first summit on LGBT issues in medical education. We hosted the National Transgender Health Summit. We held the third annual LGBTQI Health Forum, and last but not least, the first UC system-wide committee on LGBT climate was established and is co-chaired by our very own Shane Snowden. Thank you, Shane, for your outstanding leadership. Thank you for your outstanding leadership and for making UCSF a leader in LGBT health and equity. Thank you to the CAC GLBTI for the tremendous work that you've done to improve the climate on campus for GLBT faculty, students, and staff. And Vice Chancellor Navarro and I look forward to continuing that collaboration with you. The award recipients are exemplars of service to the GLBT and UCSF communities. Their dedication and hard work makes a significant contribution to the excellence here at UCSF, but they cannot do it alone. I believe we each have a personal responsibility to make UCSF an inclusive and equitable institution. We have a responsibility to look beyond differences and use the diversity we have on this campus as a gift, as opportunities to facilitate education and growth. It is my hope that the Office of Diversity and Outreach will enhance the path for all groups at UCSF so they may continue to thrive and give back. And now to present uh, now to present the award recipients with this distinguished honor is our Chancellor, Susan Desmond Hellman. Thank you. Thank you, Misty. And uh, many thanks uh, to Rob Daroff and the members of the award selection committee. I, I'm assuming it was really hard work, as you said. And uh, since I see the end product of your labors, I can tell you, I know you did a great job because we have a terrific group of honorees this year whose work is making an enormous difference in advancing GLBT professional, personal, and healthcare options here at UCSF. Uh, I, I want to particularly thank um, the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on GLBT Issues and to UCSF's Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Resource Center as well. As you just heard, one of the objectives that I have personally on campus is to enhance the environment here for everybody to prosper and to thrive. And as I've gotten more personally involved with the hiring of, of Renee in her new role in our 4CI committee, I can tell you that Shane does a great job and many of the people on this campus who care deeply about uh, uh, LGBT issues really um, perform a great service as citizens of UCSF and I'm very grateful for that. And I love coming and participating in this event because one of my privileges is to get to introduce you to some people and give you insight onto why they were selected for this very distinguished award. And I always find that these sessions are incredibly inspiring in touching each of us on how our actions can make a difference on our campus. So thanks for being such great role models. So let me start first with Dr. Michael Reyes. Our first honoree is the faculty recipient of the 2011 Chancellor's Award for GLBT Leadership, 
not only for his compassionate leadership in HIV AIDS care, treatment, and education since 1986, but also for a lifetime of championing GLBT issues. As principal investigator for the Pacific AIDS Education and Training Center, Michael has fostered a supportive environment for all of the center's staff. On a more personal level, Michael has served as a mentor to many gay and lesbian individuals on campus, advising them on both their careers and their research. I have also greatly benefited from his insights through his tenure as co-chair of my advisory committee on GLBT issues. On a national level, Michael serves on the boards of so many organizations, it is impossible to mention all of them today. <laughs> How long do we have? Those cupcakes are waiting. But, but they range from the AIDS Alliance for Children, Youth, and Families in Washington, D.C., to the Asian Pacific Islander Wellness Center. Finally, as a member of the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association since 1998, Michael has served as a resource for gay and lesbian physicians in this country and abroad by sharing his extensive background working with the Health Resources and Service Administration on the Ryan White Care Act and other government agencies in the funding, planning, and implementing of HIV AIDS education and training programs. Michael, hearty congratulations. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, may I call you Sue? <laughs> how she signs her emails to me, so. All right, quick poll. How many watched the Tony Awards last night? <laughs> and then apparently there was some basketball game. How many watched that? <laughs> okay. Well, the Tony Awards were extremely gay positive last night, and, and they were quite inspirational for me. It was hosted by uh, Neil Patrick Harris, Doogie Howser, who's an openly gay man now. There was an edgy opening number where they invited our straight friends back to Broadway because Broadway's not just for gays anymore. <laughs> there were multiple acceptance speeches where same-sex partners were acknowledged, and then there was awards for Larry Kramer's 1985 play, The Normal Heart which was about the rise of the AIDS crisis in New York, and it was very poignant 30 years after the epidemic as we mark that anniversary um, that, that, that that happened. So it lifted me up and, and made me even feel more humble as I stand before you amongst peer, family, friends. And this ceremony has always been great to me, not just because of the stories, but because of the fact that in my daily life I get to work with the previous awardees and I'm not even knowing that I'm working with the future awardees who are very engaged in this work on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to thank the Chancellor and the Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Outreach for the efforts that have been made in the last year to increase the definition of diversity beyond um, just to, uh, standard race and ethnicity. It's really broad here at UCSF. And I have great pride in working in an institution that continues to lead the way for academic centers across the nation in LGBT health. My journey here, just I just feel like I've been touched by fortune the entire time in many realms of my life. We live in this incredible progressive environment where there are incredible number of resources and skincare products. <laughs> And that allows me to be in a position where I can bring resources and my skills to the betterment of LGBT health. There'll be a consultation out by the cupcakes later. Um, and I've got gifts, I think, from both of my parents combined to help me look at the world in an amusing way when sometimes the world is not all that amusing. I had a remarkable medical school class where 10% of the people were out gay and lesbian people. That was in the mid 80s and they actually helped the young man they saw on the first day come in in the purple muscle t-shirt, the white overalls and the lavender slip-ons <laughs> who didn't really know who he was. <laughs> but they knew. <laughs> and they helped me and I had faculty mentors and faculty role models 
both positive and negative. There were so many gay and lesbian faculty role models, I was able to have positive and negative ones. And they, uh, there was one faculty member who gave an LGBT health lecture at the very beginning, and the purpose of doing that in the first year was to get people to come up afterwards and network and meet each other. It was a specific strategy. I was, I've been fortunate to be trained in family medicine, where uh, considered one of the more tolerant specialties within medicine, and that has trained me to define family broadly, to be a good listener, to build my empathic toolkit about the importance of healing over curing, and that health encompasses many different things for many people. And I'm also very thankful for my family, which is a mixed race family who have really invested in teaching across all generations. And they've had their own journey across the LGBT acceptance spectrum from fear and anxiety uh, and distance at the beginning where my mom's first reaction when I came out to her was, well, I should have known when you showed an interest in China. <laughs> that was before I was doing global health, so it wasn't the country. And then inquiry and tolerance, moving along the spectrum. One, one Pride Month, she called me and she said, I really need to know, what's the connection between Judy Garland and gay people? <laughs> and I actually pretended to have an answer. And then on to advocacy. I'm really proud about the um, attitudes that are in the younger generation. I have a very active 18-year-old niece who um, is a very uh, big proponent for gay marriage and anti-hate um, advocate, and uh, to the point where she asked me to join a Facebook group called, Please Let Gay Men Donate Blood. <laughs> and uh, my first reaction was, they need a better name. <laughs> and then finally, to be in this room with my cousin Ivy who works at the medical center here and is on the Chancellor's Committee for LGBT Health. And she is a role model for our family. She and her partner and uh, Deb have been in one of the <clears throat> longest relationships uh, in our family, and I think it's a wonderful model. So I've been fortunate to work under the umbrella of HIV, but be able to uh, bring LGBT issues to the forefront it's been great to have Joanne Keatley join our project and help me on a very steep and bracing and exciting learning curve in transgender health. And I'm just continually surprised as I turn corners and, and see the discrimination and the problems in transgender health and, and seeing how a lot of that is stigma rooted in just fear of the unknown and that we get to, with our team, have a journey to try and improve things. I'm incredibly encouraged by our current climate, and I don't know how long it's going to last, but to look at the sports page in the Chronicle, which I never do, <laughs> mostly for pictures, but, <laughs> but to see dialogues in there about athletes kind of being proactive about gay marriage, about anti-homophobia, uh, a CEO of a professional team coming out and getting support of, of his players, really incredible. Um, and then we have Secretary Sibelius from Health and Human Services who's outlined a way forward for LGBT health that this campus is going to be very engaged in. And yet my international work brings me back to reality. I see a lot of heartbreaking stigma and discrimination on the international front, and I do think we're coming up on a campus dialogue about Uganda and the anti-gay a legislation that keeps bubbling up there. There are researchers here who are afraid to be on the out list for fear they'll be outed in Uganda and could have their life in peril. So our work is not done for any of us, for the inv actively engaged past awardees who I admire greatly, the future awardees who are probably in, probably in this room and don't know it, and I think I've, I just look forward to working on the strong partnerships that we've developed across programs, across the entire campus, to improve LGBT health. And so I'm going to end with one other Tony Award reflection. <laughs> it's just a simple number. <laughs> no. For, for those of you that watched last night, the Tony of the Awards made me think for the very first time that we might be recovering 
from the decimation that the hiv epidemic did to the arts community it was just the most vibrant wonderful open evening and longtime aids activist playwright and author larry kramer one of the co-founders of the gay men's health crisis uh, in new york said this in his acceptance speech for the normal heart which won best play revival i think and I, I was just inspired. I couldn't say it better myself. He said, I could not have written it had not so many of us so needlessly died. Learn from it and carry on the fight. Let them know that we are very special people and exceptional people and that our day will come. Thank you. Great. Broadway's not just for gays anymore. <laughs> That's a great line. Chris Wadling is our second honoree. Chris is the staff recipient of the 2011 Chancellor's Award for GLBT Leadership. He is the manager of the X-ray facility in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at Mission Bay, and he also serves on my advisory committee. Chris has recently updated the new graduate student manual to include information on GLBT immigration and legal rights, increasing our understanding of the distinct issues GLBT students may face, whether they come to us from across the country or across the world. He is also a tremendous resource to the International Students and Scholars Office and has created a resource page for their website about the specific challenges that same-sex couples face when they come to this country on non-immigrant visas. But is the initiative Chris has taken in a more informal venue that makes him particularly worthy of recognition today? Chris co-founded the Mission Bay GLBT Weekly Coffee Hour to foster a supportive environment at our newest campus. That gathering has grown into both a monthly happy hour and a Facebook presence, hopefully with a better name, <laughs> that extends that safe, friendly environment to the entire university. And recently, a similar coffee hour began at the Parnassus campus. People who know Chris comment on his outgoing nature, his ready smile, sense of humor, and easy friendliness, which make him an easy person to talk to. He's used those natural attributes to the advantage of our GLBT community and UCSF as a whole, and we all greatly appreciate it. Congratulations, Chris. Um, well, first of all, um, I'd like to thank my husband, Tim, um, Tim Chan, who's on his Blackberry again, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, good. Uh, Tim has been by my side. Uh, he's helped me find my way through my, my mistakes to my successes. And he's been my reality check for the last 10 years. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, those who nominated me, James, Ron, Clement, everybody um, for this award. And the selection committee, thank you all for thinking that what I do is worthy of this award. Um, and to my tireless cheerleader, Shane Snowden, um, I, I don't think I'd be anywhere close to this podium without you. Many of you may regard me as sort of a cheerleader or a, a social coordinator for the LGBT listserv, and I, I, guess, I guess I am now. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've seen at least one of my 145 emails that I've sent to the, to the, to the listserv. Um, while in grad school and doing my postdoc, I, I actually wasn't all that social with my university peers. Um, I know this had a lot to do with coming out at the time, uh, 
feeling my need to keep my new gay social life separate, completely separate from my professional world, and not knowing how to balance the two. But mostly it was in not having an on-campus support network like we have here at UCSF uh, that I could rely on. An article in last month's Chemical and Engineering News, uh, yes, I'm going to talk about a, a reference an article, um, <laughs> on coming out in the chemical sciences kind of sums, sums how I felt up perfectly, and, and maybe, maybe you. It says, I leave myself at home when I come to work. When I go home, I'm able to be my whole self again. At this, at this point, it's just a compromise that I have to make, and the other choice for me is to be so nervous that I can't function. On leaving my postdoc and coming to UCSF 11 years ago, I carried that mindset with me, that work was just a place for work. I convinced myself that it wasn't necessary to have gay groups on campus, or in the workplace for that matter, thinking that especially in San Francisco, we had all the gay that we would ever need in the city around us. And, and as a researcher, I had convinced myself that it wasn't appropriate or even necessary to bring my gay self to work. But in 2007, my attitude began to change after I joined the LGBT listserv, um, after seeing one of the visibility project posters. My very first email was to invite everybody to a, a shopping party at Sports Basement that my husband Tim had won. It's all about the shopping. <laughs> Um, at that event, as I introduced myself to people, I realized that I didn't know any other LGBT people on campus. I'd worked here seven years and didn't have a single other LGBT person on campus that I could call a friend. It occurred to me that I didn't really know any other people on campus, besides those in my lab group, some of whom are here today. Thank you, guys. Um, and even then, I wasn't socializing with them outside the lab. It was all within the lab. Um, it turned out that UCSF was kind of a lonely place for me. And it's because I still wasn't bringing my whole self to work all those years. If a straight coworker from outside of my comfort zone of, of our lab mentioned that their spouse, I'd freeze up thinking about the reaction or professional consequences that, that telling them about my husband would bring. What I discovered after two decades of mostly keeping my work self and my gay self apart was that I needed to bring them together. And to do that, I needed the one thing I'd said wasn't necessary, an, a gay at work community, complete with role models, like Rob, and friends like Clement and, J and James and John to back me up. I get the sense that a lot of people in the sciences may have the same mindset uh, that I did about bringing their professional selves to work. Even at UCSF, most research departments don't have a single out gay faculty member. I think I'm right in saying that despite California laws and, and UCSF's amazing culture of acceptance. Gay faculty, staff, and graduate students, medical students, and postdocs still get unclear signals as to whether it's okay or not to be out at work. I credit getting married in 2008 and the No on Eight uh, outreach that I did in the fall of that year, letting me see things differently. Without the knowledge, though, that there were people like Patrick Unimori, Stuart Gaffney, Jen Markovics, Amber Schiffer, and all of you I'm not sure I would have had the strength to do it. If I hadn't found the LGBT community here at UCSF, I never would have volunteered with any of the holiday love events that Amber Schiffer put on and that Tiffany Bennett has so wonderfully carried forward. I never would have met Jeffrey Kaminsky, who's no longer at UCSF, but with, with whom I started the Mission Bay Coffee Hours. Nor would I have met Larry Lariosa, who is working right now, um, <laughs> but with whom I continue to do coffee hours every week. I wouldn't have met Joey, who does the Parnassus Coffee Hours, or Martin, who suggested that we start doing happy hours. I think they were getting, coffee wasn't enough, quite enough of a buzz for them. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't have met any of the people that I now look forward to seeing on a, at least a monthly basis, often a weekly basis. The best part about joining this community is I, that I've gotten to work with some of the best people on the Chancellor's Advisory Committee that that I, I could possibly have ever worked with. They're, um, they're the most inspiring people, and, uh, and I, I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to work with you. Now, the work that I've done with my LGBT coworkers and friends in the past three years has taught me one of the greatest things I've ever learned, the importance of community, whatever your community. I marvel at the strength, the strength that being part of a community brings a person. 
and my work with this motivating UCSF LGBT community has encouraged me to join other community building efforts and to get out and do more in my own neighborhood within the city, allowing me to push myself in ways I've never expected. Whoever you are and whatever you do, don't let UCSF be a lonely place. And for anyone who's not entirely out at work or following the, if someone asks me, I'll tell them kind of model, or is questioning or wondering if they can even be out at UCSF, or if it'll hurt their career, or if they think their coworkers will treat them differently, let me say this. One day a postdoc who'd used my lab for a couple of years came in to say goodbye and to tell me that he was gay and that word around the building was that I was too. Um, if you aren't fully out to everyone at work, but you don't appear to date or talk about the opposite sex in ways that we talk about the opposite sex, um, if you're that way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some of you may understand that. Um, you, don't ask, you don't talk about personal life details like others do, or you do use gender neutral pronouns. I guarantee you that your coworkers are talking about you behind your back. I do it, so I guarantee other people are. No, it, if you wait for the right moment or situation to tell someone, chances are you never will. Or if you're counting on waiting for someone to find out, you'll make that person, whether it be your boss or your coworker or your fellow student, feel like you didn't trust them enough to be okay with you being gay. I believe that you can hurt your relationship with that person more than if you simply found a way of telling them early on. If it's your boss, it could even affect their desire to write a glowing recommendation for you. In closing, let me quote again from last month's Chemical and Engineering News, <laughs> if I may. A woman by the name of Zoe Kuznia, a quality control assistant at Genentech, whose transition from female to male began in 2008. She said, there's a recognition that the science doesn't happen without engaged employees. And when a person can bring their full, authentic self to work, they're going to be a happier, more satisfied, and more productive employee. Straight employees bring their, their full, authentic, straight selves to work every day without even realizing it. And now, as someone who tries not to hide his full, authentic, gay self at work anymore, I can truly say I'm happier, more satisfied, and hopefully more productive. The UCSF LGBT community is one that I can now proudly say, tell people at work that I belong to. I now feel closer to all my coworkers, and even those in my comfort zone, as I get and I get the sense that they see that I'm more at ease with them too. I encourage all gay faculty, students and staff to bring your gay selves to work and to openly join our community as will be one of the best decisions you ever make. Thank you all for being part of this community and thank you all for coming today. We've traveled from the Tony Awards to chemical and engineering news. <laughs> Ilana, uh, no pressure. <laughs> Ilana Scherer is our third and final honoree. She is the recipient for 2011 for the student, resident, or postdoctoral Chancellor's Award for GLBT leadership. Ilana is a third-year pediatric resident at UCSF and has a strong understanding of the needs of gender-variant children. She has three main goals. To create a setting where gender-variant children can receive appropriate specialty and general medical care. To educate pediatricians and other health care providers about gender variance. And to teach gender-variant children and their families how to advocate for themselves within medical settings. To achieve those goals, Ilana has helped to establish a UCSF medical home for gender variant youth in the Bay Area Youth Gender Acceptance Project, Bay Gap. Ilana has also developed healthcare provider modules that she presents at local and national forums and has received an invitation to start a GLBT special interest group for the American Academy of Pediatrics. 
She has also reached out to families in myriad ways, including creating a brochure to help them find an appropriate pediatrician for their gender variant children. I am so impressed with the work that Alana has already done, and I'm greatly, like all of you, going to watch her future medical career unfold. Congratulations, Alana. First of all, I just want to say how great is it that there's a special award for a student or resident because I could never hope to accomplish as much as you guys have, <laughs> but what an inspiration for me to be starting off my career and to be able to have all these role models right in front of me. And so I'm so honored to be up here. And I'm really honored to be up here too after listening to your speeches to think about how much has changed between our generations. Not that you're that much older than me. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Nowadays, when I ask a teenager about their sexual attractions, it's not uncommon to hear something like, well, today I'm like 80-20, 80% 80 gay, 20% straight, or one 16-year-old boy told me that gay is so passe, because nowadays everyone's kind of both. And I do feel like I'm caught up in this momentum of things that are happening and changing. And I think about what it would have been like had I been born 30 years ago, and then I would have been a resident at the general hospital now. And that would have been a very different experience. It's a very different kind of momentum that's happening now. And so it's the people who made that possible that I really want to thank. Um, and we don't have to look any farther than people at our own institution. So first of all, Shane Snowden, you're like changing medical education forever. <laughs> And I think that people who are constantly challenging the status quo, especially with gender nonconforming identities, are people who really, those are the people who are really, I think, taking the biggest risk. Um, and so a lot of the kids that we are seeing at the Gender Center here at UCSF are my role models, and those are the people that I think are some of the most incredible people. I also think about people, so my, my um, cousin had a, a big gay Jewish wedding in the early 90s. That was before it was the normal thing to do. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and there were comments from, you know, my grandma like, it's fine if they want to get married, but why do they, or want to be together, but why do they have to rub our noses in it? And my little elderly Aunt Esther stood up on the stage and toasted to her new son. And that made a huge difference to me at 14 and at, you know, 23 or 4 when I finally came out. Um, and people like that that are changing things in smaller ways. Um, I also want to thank the people who believe enough in me to, to nominate me for this award. That was incredible. Thank you to my mentors and to my co-residents who are here sitting in the back so that they can answer their pages, <laughs> especially for the residents who are covering my patients right now in the pediatric ICU so that I don't get paged out of this speech to go <laughs> clarify an order. So thank you. Um, and I want to also thank Steve Rosenthal here, who's been one of my partners in, in um, developing this gender project, and who, if I could be one eighth of, one quarter of, of uh, one sixteenth <laughs> of the career you've had, I will be happy. And my partner, Alana, and yes, it's a very lesbian stereotype, but we have the same first name. Um, <laughs> is someone who constantly pushes the boundaries and my own personal comfort um, by being out everywhere, including in her professional world. And I told her this story once. I, was, um, I asked one of my, the mom of one of my patients if she felt safe at home, and she answered in Spanish, well, sure, except for the gays who live upstairs. And I was, I was just shocked. <laughs> like, I had no idea what to say, and I told her that story, and she's like, oh, well, when people say things like that to me, here's what I say. And I was just like, wow, what, an, what a person. So she's watching this from Peru. Um, that's why we're videotaping it, so thank you guys for uh, being videotaped right now. There's one person who I think about the most in my life, though, and I think he's the one person who, who has influenced me the most in what I do and who I feel like really makes me realize how lucky I am to be born when I was. And that's my Uncle Eddie. Um, he got sick when I was about seven, and he was in a hospital in New York City, which was a couple hours away from where I grew up in Pennsylvania. And every weekend, we drove up there to visit him. And every weekend, I sat in the waiting room because I was seven and not able to go visit him. Um, and then on the Mondays afterward, my, my, my parents would say, don't tell anyone where you've been. 
Um, and I remember there was one time I got to visit him. Um, and I wore like a special little outfit. I had like ruffly socks and little matching floral suspenders and a hair barrette and a denim skirt and patent leather shoes. And uh, I remember the entire outfit. And <laughs> <laughs> when I left the hospital, my mom made me strip down to my underwear and threw out everything um, in a trash can on the sidewalk as we left the hospital. And he died and my parents told everyone that he died of cancer and they told me never to mention him again. Um, and I did when I was like 18 and I got in a lot of trouble for that. But at the time, you know, and I, I asked my mom throughout my childhood, like, why don't we talk about him? She's like, we don't want people to ask questions. And I wondered what those questions were. And looking back on it, there were a lot of clues. Like we inherited a whole stack of Sondheim VHS. Um, and then there was this jacket in the back of the closet that I found one day that said New York gay man's chorus. And I was like, where's that from? Um, and so I, I confronted her about it when I was about 18, and I said, what are these questions? And, that, and that's how I found out that he was gay. And I asked my mom why she didn't want people to know, and, and she said something like, well, he lived a really sad life, and he was all alone. And I didn't really believe her. And so Google came out, and I did what all college students do, and I Googled his name, and um, I actually found that there were a number of people that um, published obituaries about him, or there was a memorial page at the synagogue that he went to, and he had a square in the AIDS quilt. So I Googled those names, and I got in touch with some people who were still alive who knew him. And what they described was that, that he was part of their community and that one day he just disappeared. Like, he stopped coming to synagogue and he stopped coming to choir rehearsals, and then a couple weeks later they found out that he died, and. and and no one really knew where he went in that time. And, and that was the time that my parents saw him and where he seemed to be all alone, and they were caring for him. Um, and that had a really big influence on me. And when I came out to my family many years after I left home, um, my mom said that she was really sad for me that I would have such a hard and lonely life, which is the same word she said about my uncle. And I was like, what are you talking about because I came out into this community of amazing people, most of whom weren't queer, um, but who were like, yeah, we knew. And I was like totally head over heels in love for the first time in my life. And I thought, how is my life going to be made harder or sadder because of this? And it never occurred to me that that was the perception. I think especially because of how hard it was a generation before. And my mom, unfortunately, has not really lost that perception. And yeah, there are things that are more difficult in my life, but I think as many people can relate to, my life was not made more hard and difficult by this. If anything, it was made richer and easier in some ways. Um, I think a lot about my uncle as sort of like a guardian angel, and I don't actually know what my beliefs are in the afterlife, which is a much deeper question than I can get into in five minutes. But, um, but, but I do. I have often kind of thought about him like watching over me, and and we never knew each other as adults, but I think that we would have liked each other, and and um, I did watch all of his musicals and got really into them. But my work on behalf of gender nonconforming children is my hope and my way of trying to pay forward the gift that my gay ancestors have given me. And I think that there is still so much to be done to create equal rights for lesbian and gays everywhere. But I think sometimes that that fight for visibility and equal rights for LGBT people is, ends up being really about the fights for equal rights for gay and lesbian adults. But I think the people that are hurt most right now by, by, by homophobia and by transphobia are people who are gender nonconforming, and especially kids, some of which are as young as two years old. So I can't really imagine what it's like to be a two-year-old who's gender nonconforming. And I think some of those kids are going to grow up to be transgender, and some are going to be gay, and some of them are going to be straight and will be left out when we talk about LGBT stuff. But I think the important thing for me is that we do the work now so that they grow up. Because right now, about one third of them attempt suicide. And I can imagine, even though I can't imagine what it's like to be two and gender nonconforming, or I can't imagine what it's like to be a six year old that I saw um, in the emergency room after trying to cut off um, the child identified as a he, his penis, um, but was gender nonconforming. I can imagine, and because I know what it's like to be 12 or 21 or 30, and to feel like you live in a world that can't accept you for who you are, or to be within a family that can't accept you for who you are. So my hopes for the Gender Center at UCSF is that it will 
change the lives of the patients it serves, which I know that it's already doing, but that it will reach thousands of other people. Because by acknowledging the existence of gender diverse kids and affirming their identity and not asking them to change and doing that on an institutional level as large and as well known as UCSF, that we can serve as a model for pediatricians, for doctors, for hospital administrators, basically everyone everywhere else in the world who's looking at what we're doing. Um, and that we can treat gender nonconforming kids with respect and love and convince everyone else that that's the appropriate thing to do too. I want to be able, especially because I am a pediatrician, my goal is to train all pediatricians to recognize gender variance because we're the ones who are seeing these kids at two or three. Um, and I want to train pediatricians to address these issues of acceptance so that they can reinforce positive messages that kids are going to hear growing up. So I want coming out for gender nonconforming kids, whether or not they even ever need to come out, to be basically a moot point. Because my hope is that I was raised in this really supportive, uh, I, I was came out into a really supportive environment um, where coming out was really not a big issue, and I want the same thing for them. So that's the gift that I'm hoping to give. Wow. Thank you, Chancellor. And let's give another uh, round of applause for Michael, Chris, and Alana for your inspiring words, for your incredible work on behalf of all of us. Speaking on behalf of all of us, I want you to know how much we appreciate the work that you, that you have done. Before we break for our reception, uh, we wanted to share some exciting news on campus as further evidence of just how far we've come. The following statement was released just a few weeks ago from our Academic Senate, representing the voice of all UCSF faculty. And this is just an excerpt, but I quote, evidence has shown that marriage inequality is a significant factor in health care disparity, and the Academic Senate at UCSF expresses its support for marriage equality for its LGBT faculty, staff, students, and their families, period. Thank you to our award winners, our nominees, our chancellor, and to all of you for making this the best place on earth to work. Now let's go have some cupcakes. <laughs>